Good noon, everybody. Welcome uh, to our Ask Me Anything event. My name is Katherine Miller Wilson, and I'm the executive director of Highest Pennsylvania. Um, we are very excited to be here today for our live video series. You can watch our previous Ask Me Anythings on Highest Pennsylvania's YouTube page or on our website at www.highestpa.org and in the video section of Highest Pennsylvania's Facebook page. So lots of options. Um, Highest Pennsylvania is a nonprofit whose mission is to provide immigration, legal, and social services to low-income immigrants and refugees. And we're here today uh, to actually talk about um, sort of the the flip side of immigration, which is um, our country and the businesses in our state who are receiving them. Every day there are stories of staffing crises in almost every industry. We need more doctors, nurses, social workers, truck drivers, teachers. What some view as a staffing crisis, I see as an immigration crisis. We have a labor shortage while hundreds of thousands of people who want to work are prevented from doing so every single day. Today, we're excited to be speaking with Sarah Steltz from the Chamber of Commerce for Greater Philadelphia and Highest Pennsylvania staff member Shalu Joes, who's here to share both her personal story and the story of hundreds of her clients. As the Chamber of Commerce for Greater Philadelphia's Vice President of Economic Competitiveness, Sarah Steltz provides strategic direction and leadership in support of the Chamber's mission to enhance the Greater Philadelphia region's overall competitiveness by attracting and expanding companies, capital, and talent in key growth sectors. And for those of you who may have been paying attention to the mayoral race, you'll know that attracting business is pretty much a number one priority or number two behind stemming the gun violence um, for many of Philadelphia residents who um, are engaged in the upcoming election. Shalu Joes is the director of the Asylee Outreach Program at Highest Pennsylvania. She provides immigration legal representation to asylees so that they can move forward on their path to permanent residency, including by obtaining work authorization for them. She also works with asylees to obtain employment services and other critical resources on the path to self-sufficiency. She understands the challenge of obtaining work authorization on a very personal level as she has lived it. We're very excited about our conversation today because we believe it is so timely given everything that's happening both in the world and in the state and in our city of Philadelphia. Please feel free to submit questions in the chat and we'll get to as many as we can. But in the meantime, um, keep your just questions general. If you have specific legal questions or need legal representation, please contact us directly. Um, Rebecca Weber, our master of ceremonies, will be putting our um, intake phone number in the chat. We can't give legal advice over Zoom, so that's why we can't handle an individual inquiry during today's program. We also would love to hear your ideas on future topics for future videos. You can watch our previous Ask Me Anythings on Highest PA's YouTube page, as I said at the beginning. Welcome, Sarah and Shalou. So I want to start with questions from me. Sarah, can you begin by telling us about the Chamber of Commerce for Greater Philadelphia and about your role within the Chamber? Sure, yes. Thanks, Catherine. Hello, everybody. Nice to be here. Uh, as Catherine mentioned, I'm the Vice President of Economic Competitiveness at the Chamber, and that role and the team that I sit on is really focused on what is effectively economic development. As Catherine said, we're focused on attracting and developing and retaining both businesses and talent, and then thinking about how we market the region, tell the story of all the opportunity that we know is available here in Greater Philadelphia for in support of sustained inclusive economic growth. And specifically, my team and I work on a series of talent related initiatives um, in the hope of connecting the talent that is here, developing the talent that is here to ultimately connect to high quality occupations at the organizations within our region. And broadly, the chamber seeks to grow business here in greater Philadelphia by fostering cooperation. And we do that work for and with our members. 
and we bring together businesses and civic leaders to create opportunity. And our membership is broad. I know Greater Philadelphia to us means membership that goes across 11 counties and three states. And in total, it's about 600,000 employees from our member companies and organizations. So we bring together all of these different types of organizations and businesses to build community. And we think that it helps us to find commonality that we pursue um, a, in a number of different ways. But overall, the goal is to build a stronger business climate through advocacy and diversity and equity and inclusion initiatives um, and some of the other things that we'll describe today. Great. Can you tell us what you're hearing from the chamber members about the current employment outlook in uh, Philly and, and Pennsylvania and their ability to fill open positions? Sure. So as I just said, you know, we support organizations big and small, but regardless of the industry, all the businesses seem to have one common uh, theme that they're bringing to the fore, which is that they are having trouble hiring as many employees as they'd like. And when they're able to hire employees uh, at the numbers they'd like, they are having difficulty retaining them. And I think the organizations within our membership and within our community are in no way unique in that regard. You know, um, I saw a survey from the Society for Human Resources Management and, and its member organization said that uh, about 75% of the employers were experiencing a decrease in applicants for the jobs that are hardest to fill. And the gap between open jobs and unemployed individuals is still really wide. And I think there are mixed feelings, you know, about how we got here. But as usual, I think it's probably some combination of a number of factors. So retirement, you know, long COVID impact, high quit rates, workers slow to return, the impact of gig work, and of course, immigration interruptions, which we'll, we'll talk about today. But whatever the factors, you know, the sentiments are the same, people need workers. And I, I think at the rate our GDP has grown, we're still about missing about two and a half million workers, basically. And I saw a statistic just last week that stuck with me. If every unemployed person in the US, so nearly six million people, took one of the open jobs, we would still have nearly 5 million jobs available. Wow, that's pretty astonishing. Um, and yet, uh, as right. we get into more, uh, you know, we are saying uh, loud and clear that we don't want immigrants um, by our policies, by our laws, uh, which is really astounding. So are there particular industries that are affected by the current staffing crisis? I, I think that, you know, I think that the it's universal. The need is the need is universal. I would say that there are particular occupations that have proven especially challenging. I think that roles in technology are a national challenge. And again, we're no exception here. Um, I work with a group called the CEO Council for Growth, and it is what it sounds like. It's CEOs from some of the largest organizations within the region that come together to tackle a number of specific opportunities and challenges. And they identified the need for more tech workers in the region. And in order to do some of the discovery associated with supporting that request, I looked at all of the hiring activity over the last few years for these companies. And it doesn't matter if you're in construction or if you're in healthcare, software developers, software engineers, those types of positions are within the top five positions that your organization has been hiring for. So it is really, regardless of industry, that need persists. I think we've uh, convene another group of employers in the energy and infrastructure space. And I think I've been here for just over a year. And when I started working with those employers, we were really focused on, you know, more hands-on roles, technicians, mechanics, things like that. And when we got more time together and access to more data, we saw that actually among their top five most necessary occupations, the jobs they're posting for the most and that are persistently remaining unfilled are the exact same jobs as in the other group. So we are seeing that that is nearly universal. And the other industry I, that I wanna call out here is obviously in greater Philadelphia, we're really interested in growing our existing assets in the life sciences. We think that we have the ingredients here to really be a cell and gene therapy hub, given the research institutions and the talent and the investors we have here. Um, 
but I work closely with a group of cell and gene therapy companies. And one of the big factors inhibiting their growth is talent. And this goes from high level, you know, highly educated PhD talent on the research side, the whole way through roles that are more on the manufacturing side of the house where a bachelor's degree isn't necessarily required. The needs are persistent for roles in that industry. And I think I would be, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention, you know, we have 2026 coming up. We have a number of large events that are coming, including the World Cup. I know we're all excited, but in order to support that level of tourism, we have to maintain our existing workforce and not just maintain it, we have to grow it. And I think right now we know and, and hear this anecdotally from member organizations that there are over 1.5 unfilled hospitality jobs in the country. And that number is most likely on the rise. You know, it's so important, um, Sarah, to hear you say that. I think it bears repeating because, you know, as I opened up the, the mayoral contest that is upcoming has certainly provoked a lot of questions about how do we grow industry? How do we grow business? But we didn't talk about how do we grow the workforce, you know? And uh, that is obviously a problem that is very, very high on the chamber's minds, on business owners' minds, and the two go together, it seems to me, right? I mean, you can't grow businesses if you don't have any workers to fill the positions to have the businesses there. Um, so that's very helpful. Um, so my next question you know, and it and it's okay. Um, I don't know what you know what your answer is, but what is the chamber's policy on immigration, and how does that support business friendly public policy and economic benefits? Sure. So the chamber's policy positions are typically based on the needs of its members, and as I mentioned, our employers are hurting. In the past, like the organization has advocated for a variety of things, you know, connected to H-1B visas, pathways for university graduates, um, and reforms to bureaucratic processes and interagency inter inter coordination, etc. And I think we are under new leadership here at the chamber, so our position continues to be fine-tuned, but I don't think that it's controversial to acknowledge the role that immigration has played in the current in the current labor shortage. So there, you know, there are, we talked about some of the factors in the labor shortage, but a decline in immigration in immigrants is certainly one of those factors. I think there are about two million fewer work, working age immigrants here then there would have been should pre-COVID trends have, have continued. And roughly half of those who would have been in this country would have had university degrees. And I think the Fed chairman, he acknowledges that probably uh, immigration is one of the largest factors, along with retirements and direct kind of loss of life associated with COVID, what are the primary factors contributing to our current shortages. Now, it's so interesting that you said that because, you know, the the other headlines besides headlines about staffing crises that we keep seeing are, you know, the the overwhelming numbers of immigrants at our southern border. So what how do you tally if if um, loss of immigrants is actually a thing that's been well documented, then where what <laughs> what's the difference? Why is there that? And then yet there are these headlines about numbers at our southern border. Do you have any idea what that's about? I don't think I can speculate on, on that, Catherine, but it does seem that there should be some connection made between the two. I think what I think, and this is uh, partly what Sarah thinks uh, as a result of working with employers, is that we are we're nearing full employment here. So anybody who wants a job and is authorized to work. Mm. can find one right now. <laughs> and we assumed that when the pandemic receded, people were going to run back to work and they didn't. They didn't do what we thought that they would do. So the question is whether or not this is, people use the word structural, whether or not this is permanent. And if it is, or even if it's not, I see our members and other businesses coming around to the idea that you have to think differently about you how you hire. And you have to explore new sources of talent. You have to support other avenues. And once you get those new folks, new talent coming from a variety of places, 
into your workforce, you have to support them. So what I see is that if we can't be complacent about what is happening in the labor market, it's not going to magically swing back. So I think it presents an opportunity for employers who haven't yet engaged immigrant populations uh, to hopefully think about how they might do so. Great. And just um, to be clear for our audience, and I know, Sarah, you wouldn't necessarily know the ins and outs of this because you're not an immigration attorney. Shalou is going to share this a little bit. Um, but, you know, work authorization is a whole different legal process than some of the other processes that we are aware about, things like asylum or refugee status, um, you know, refugees do come with automatic work authorization, which is great, but asylum seekers have to wait months and months and months and months before they get temporary work authorization. Then once they get asylum, they have to renew their request, and all of that makes it difficult on the employer. But um, Shalou is going to talk more about that, but I just wanted to make sure um, at this point that our, that our um, listeners understood um, so there's a question in the chat for an asylum seeker, where and how to contact for a job? Are there specific organizations in Delaware? So I'm going to take that question. Um, and Sarah, you can jump in if there's additional. So if you're an asylum seeker work with work authorization, you can go to programs like ours, like Nationality Services Center, like Bethany Christian um, Services. We all have um, employment programs for those who have asylum. If you're an asylum seeker and you have work author authorization, it's more difficult to find an employment program, but you are work authorized. So you can go to organizations like JEBS or the Department of Public Welfare um, to try to get those jobs. Um, and I don't know, Sarah, is there a job board that the um, Chamber of Commerce has? We do, we have, I mentioned a few specific industries where we're working deeply with employers. We do have life sciences jobs and technology jobs posted through our website. Um, and I would have mentioned, you know, Kevin, a lot of the same programs that you pointed out in terms of connecting to, to opportunities. So those, those jobs are there. Um, and I'd encourage people to, to check out those boards and I can drop a link in the chat if we have, uh, once I'm done talking. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's great. That's great. Um, so, and also I just noticed, and I apologize, this uh, questioner was asking, are there specific organizations in Delaware? So um, there, there are likely, um, but that would be something we'd have to answer offline because um, I have to look it up. So, because <laughs> we're serving Pennsylvania and of course the chamber is serving Philadelphia. So um so there you are. Um, okay, thank you very much for that question. Keep them coming. Um, so Sarah, can you discuss the Chamber's inclusive growth uh, Philadelphia agenda and how that focus on creating family sustaining jobs will build a safer city? Sure. Yeah, we, you know, as a Chamber, we recognize Philadelphia's persistent poverty rate as both deeply un unjust and a tremendous barrier to our overall economic growth. So we think that access to opportunities is something that we're in a position to advocate for. And we see some of this work connected to the need for safer streets and communities, certainly. Um, we do believe that our tax structure is, is burdensome for businesses and that it hurts job creation. And then we're also working together to with a group of organizations to streamline some of the city government processes. So we think that these pillars are something that we can mobilize around. And, and we've done that with a group called the Inclu Inclusive Growth Coalition. Uh, its member organizations are numerous, but it includes chamber, our Chamber of Commerce, of course, and then uh, many of the diverse chambers, you know, the Asian American Chamber, the Hispanic Chamber, and the African American Chamber. And we've 
taken on a pretty robust, you know, advocacy agenda, trying to work with city government in order to advance a number of different things, including those tax, re tax reductions. Um, but I also wanted to mention that the chamber just a few, I guess now at this point, a couple months ago, has brought on a vice president at the organization that is, among other things, focused specifically on how we can improve um, our streets and communities, particularly looking at how we can clean and green commercial corridors and neighborhoods, not just in Center City, but broadly throughout Philadelphia, throughout our 90 commercial corridors, so touching every corner. And I think probably before the end of this fiscal year, so for us, by, by July or so, we hope to be able to roll out some communications about what we have planned in that space. But this inclusive growth agenda and coalition, it's fairly young. You know, it's just been coming together for maybe a year and a half or so, maybe a little more. Uh, but I've already seen some great traction. And I'm always, you know, makes me excited about the future when you see a lot of organizations pulling together, rowing in the same direction. That's great. Um, and I think my last question, it's more directed, but it's related to this whole topic. Um, and it's specifically a state level rather than uh, federal, which is what we've been talking about. Um, so 15 states in the District of Columbia permit immigrants to drive. Uh, Pennsylvania is not currently one of them, although there is a bill that is pending in Harrisburg that would allow this. Um, is the chamber, I guess, first aware of this issue as a, as a work barrier? Um, and, you know, how, how do you guys feel about, about that? Sure. Um, so first to the specific piece of legislation that we're talking about. So I know that the chamber is is aware of this and has not made a public position, but I can see through conversation with with members that, you know, of course, the need that we've already established for workers to be able to connect to work and get to the jobs are critical. I think especially in that energy and infrastructure group that I mentioned, um, we have a lot of building trades organizations in that group. And we know that a driver's license is critical to be able to get to work sites and to have the mobility that is required to successfully attach to construction employment, where we do see a tremendous need, regardless of what's happening in the housing market, construction is still hiring. So I think for us, um, anything that we can do to open up more opportunity and allow our employers to fill their jobs is something that we're interested in, in supporting. Great. Um, well, Sarah, this is great. Um, I'm going to turn now to Shalu Joes, but we'll come back to you for, um, you know, final thoughts and wrap up. So, um, Shalu, welcome. Um, as I said, Shalu Joes is the program manager for our Siley Outreach Program, which means that she is working with people who have already received asylum. Um, and she also has personal experiences relevant to our discussion today. So, Shalu, can you share with us a little bit about your immigration journey and your experience in trying to get work authorization? Sure. First of all, thank you, Kathy, uh, for giving me this opportunity to share my story as well as my client's story here in this platform. So my story started uh, based, my I joined my husband who, who got a job, uh, was offered a position here and we came through an employment-based visa, which is an H-1B visa, and I accompanied him as his dependent. And a year later, after we arrived in the United States, um, I found highest PA and and I joined highest then. And uh, I changed my status as from a dependent to an H-1B visa holder. Uh, it's around that time we started our uh, process to get permanent residency here in the United States because we decided we would vote, we would like to stay here. And um, uh, the policy was that if in six years you don't get your H-1B, um, like, um, you know, you don't change your status or you don't get your green card within that six years, 
uh, my employer had to file for a green card. And I was like waiting because I thought my husband's green card is going to come in pretty soon. So I would wait. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. So I had to like slowly change my status back to age four. I took a break. And it was around in 2015 that the administration allowed age fours to get work authorization cards. So I didn't have to change my status. I could be on that age four status, get a work authorization card, come back and continue my job at highest PA. And uh, that's that's and that's how I kind of continued working here. And yeah, it had its had its ups and downs. <laughs> And eventually, uh, we got our green cards um, to two years, uh, a year ago, after a long wait of 16 years. Yeah. Wow. Wow. <laughs> um, well, thank you for sharing that. As, as our audience can hear, you know, there's a lot of complicated in the weeds story about any visa holder. Um, there are lots of people in the United States who have some kind of legal status that allows them to work, but so many of them like Shalu get caught in rule changes in delays caused by the system, not by her or her husband, um, and in rules that require constant renewal um, and expiration. Um, so you describe the process took, uh, I guess, more than a decade, right? Yes, <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, so, um, you know, I, I'll bring in a little bit of my role in this, um, jumping out of my, my kind of moderator hat. I became executive director in 2016. And at the time that I became executive director, Shalu was a valued long-term employee of highest Pennsylvania. Um, and I knew she, she was very knowledgeable and had a number of clients. I did not know until she came into my office crying that um, she was waiting on this work authorization. And, you know, as I learned the story, um, Shalu had had to ask, I think it was every year or every other year for every renewal other. work authorization. When she first came to highest PA, this was not a problem. She filed the papers on time, the work authorization came. But as delays that we've all read about in the news happened all over the immigration system, they also impacted the work authorization process. So that despite Shalou's timely filing of her paperwork, as she did every other year, um, it wasn't coming. Just wasn't coming, wasn't coming, wasn't coming. Um, and so this happened both that first time that I learned about this and two more times where we were stuck literally on the night before her work authorization gonna, was going to expire, trying to figure out what to do with her clients. Shalu trying to figure out how she was gonna support, you know, continue to support her family um, and the house that they purchased with one salary. Um, because in, in accordance with the rules, until that new authorization came through, she was not allowed to work. Um, and each time, Literally at the 11th hour, the work authorization came through. And so thank goodness, neither we, Highest Pennsylvania, nor Shalou's clients, nor Shalou um, had to deal with the fallout of not being able to work. But it was, as you can imagine, a tremendous disruption uh, for Shalou and her family. And for us as an agency, we had to make all kinds of contingency plans for her clients. So um, so I think that that is uh, something that is worth noting and one of the problems with the current work authorization process. Um, so I wanted to turn the attention to your clients because I know when you and I first talked about this, um, you talked about yourself, but you also said yes, and you've watched your clients go through it. So can you tell us, share with us some of the stories that you've had to um, help your clients navigate through as they wait for work authorization? Yeah, so some of my clients that I've worked, like for asylum, once somebody gets an asylum status, they don't need a work authorization card to work because that status allows you to work without a work authorization card. However, there are some clients who don't have like a photo ID because uh, if they get a work authorization card, 
that's a form of a photo ID for them and they're able to get a driver's license issued. And then, you know, with that, that becomes a form of ID to apply for a job. So it gets, it, it becomes important for, a, for my client to get that work authorization, even though they don't require it. And, um, you know, we file it right away and we just wait, we wait, we call up, we've, you know, I've tried to call up immigration and expedited the request explaining that this is, um, you know, it is really important that this person works uh, because he needs to support his family here. And they do take in my request. I kind of provide all kind of supporting documents, but we just wait. It could, it could go from six months to a year. And which means that my client is not able to work up until that time, it means that they are dependent on other resources. Right. And, you know, uh, clients are hesitant, you know, oh, we are, you know, to take that extra help that I have to force them, you know, and um, they, they are they get frustrated. And, you know, it's the, um, the you know, the, it kind of transfer over to their family, the children, if they are living with their husband, you know, their, their kids are there. It, it is really difficult. And um, I've had one client, I, I remember last year, she waited almost 18 months to get the work authorization card. And which is just, again, every two months I would have to make this phone call because once I place in a request, I have to wait for 30 days. They will respond to me and then another wait of 30 days and then I'm calling back. It's like, oh, we don't think it is, you know, a humanitarian reason for it to be expedited. So, and, uh, you know, with this new, with this new, um, you know, with the Ukrainian population coming in and the Afghan population coming in again, their uh, their work authorization cards were not coming in on time. Again, they they've already gone through so much trauma. They were ready to work, but we didn't have the cards in hand, and um, you know we. We had to kind of do advocacy. We called them, we called immigration, we called the senator's office if they could help us. So trying all the possible ways to get them, uh, you know, to get that card in hand so that they can immediately start working because employers are required to see those documents. There are certain documents that are listed. So, you know, they, they need to see that document, so yeah. Great, and we're getting a lot of good questions in the chat. So I'm just gonna go backwards. Um, an audience member asked, what are the barriers to obtaining a work authorization? So we've talked a lot about the delay and you know, remember our audience members don't necessarily know how the system works, right? So, so I guess the first question in breaking down barriers, is this a, who provides the work authorization? Is that the federal government or the state government? It's the federal, it's USCIS, which is immigration. Yeah. And uh, the, we, are, we do an application, um, which is called a form I-765. We file it with them. Then we get, you know, some uh, fee, uh, some application, in some cases, fees can be waived off depending on the situation of the client. In some cases, it's mandatory, it's not waived off. You have to put up, you know, you to pay up front, you know, the fees, the immigration fees. And then we get a receipt number. There's some of them are required to do fingerprints to go and do the fingerprints. And then we wait to get the work authorization card. Okay. And so, so why is there a wait? What is the barrier? <laughs> oh, why is there a barrier? Uh, I don't know if I can be able to answer that because it's usually with immigration. You know, according to immigration, they're required to do background checks, stuff. You know, make sure that it, that person is authorized to work. But uh, will it take six months or will it take eighteen months? I don't know because, <laughs> but um, uh, you know, it it just it is a tremendous backlog there. Um, and um, could be the volume of, you know, the people who are applying, but, you know, we've requested that these cases be distributed to different service centers, you know, who have lesser caseloads and they are able to process it. Um, I think they've started applying that to the green card applications, but not to the work authorization cards. I hope they do that. But with the recent Ukrainian population coming in and with the, with the amount of advocacy that had gone through, I think uh, there was 
they were able to expedite just that population. So now for the, for the Ukrainian population, if you file the EAD cards, they are coming in pretty quickly, but that just applies to that particular population, not the overall community. So and you said even that population, there's still delays, it seems like. Here and there, but, but not like I have to say, it's, it's better than the others, not, not like everybody else. Right. Um, yeah, so, so to be clear, then it sounds to me like there's two pieces that are causing the delay. One are the backlogs at USCIS, which is the processor, which, you know, without kind of knowing more, it seems like there isn't enough staff to process it. But I think a related uh, thing, and I'd love to know your opinion about this, Shalu, is the processing itself, right? I mean, mm -hmm. when when I think about what do I need for a work authorization, I could understand submitting something that says, yeah, here's my name, here's my address, and here is my status, right? I'm applying for asylum right. or I have asylum, you know, whatever. And, and it should be very simple. And so yes. then you just quickly read through it and like, boom. And instead, it sounds like they're asking for a lot of additional information, which is duplicative of the information that they asked for for to get asylum, to get other things, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that can come up. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. That right. can come up too. Or, you know, like we always provide all the documents when we are filing, because otherwise, if you don't file it the right way, it can get bounced back. Mm -hmm. So all the documents are provided at the time of filing. But, um, you know, the, I've had cases after sitting for six, seven months, they can just come back and ask, oh, you know, give us a proof it, of your status. It was provided with you along with that application, right? Or you can probably go into your system and, you know, check that person's status. That being said, you know, there are some delays that have, like, I just cannot explain, you know, like I've had clients call me, why, what, what's the delay? Is there some problem in my file that I'm not, I, I, you know, I have no answer. You know, this, the next step should be biometrics, which is their fingerprints, and it should be the approval. Right. It's, that's the that's thing. And some cases it gets approved. Like after 12 months, you just get the EAD card, right? The work e employment authorization mm -hmm. card. Yeah. With, and the clients were like, what were they waiting for? They didn't even ask me. They think that sometimes they think, oh, we have to be calling for an interview and things like that. No, employment, usually for those, we don't have ever had any interviews come up. So it's just the backlog. It's just right. the backlog, the prioritization of what needs to be processed quickly, um, I think, is, is what causing the delay. And requiring so much information. So much information. Really necessary. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, so there's a comment in the chat, U visa applicants wait approximately five to six years for work authorization. And just to confirm something, and then I'll get to another question. Um, so Shalu, when people are waiting for work authorization, and I know that different legal statuses have different consequences, but for example, someone who has applied for asylum, is eligible to apply for work authorization, right. but they are not eligible to apply for food stamps or cash assistance Nothing. or Medicaid, correct? Yeah. Yes. So yes. it is very unclear what our federal government expects them to do while they're waiting. Yes, right. yes, okay. yeah. And there are very few resources, like I think you were answering to one of those questions earlier, you you know, mm -hmm. like there are very few federally you know, state funded programs that can help you find employment, job, you know, employment, because everything is after, you know, you have been granted a status. There's nothing pre, you know, when you're, when you're, you know, when your asylum case is pending, right. no benefits, nothing. How is one able to survive, you know, pay right. rent? While you're waiting for work authorization and you are allowed to get work authorization when you finally get it, right. then good luck trying to f connect to all mm -hmm. these jobs that we just heard Sarah talk about. They're yes. desperate, but you know, you have to, you have to find them and yes. that's very difficult. So um, another question, um, do you know, and this is a great question. I'm not sure if you know this, Shalu, um, I don't. Do you know if other countries allow individuals applying for asylum to work immediately while the application is pending? Um, oh, I'm not. 
I can't answer to that. I don't know about that. But it's a great question, right? It's a great, because yeah. You know, and I'll, I'll say this, it's a great question for two reasons. One, it's always better to reinvent, to not reinvent the wheel, right? If you're looking for solutions to problems, it's good to look at other countries, see what they do. But the other reason why it's a great question is because the reality is almost every other Western country is facing both staffing crises like we are and um, uh, immigrants needing needing shelter, needing safe places. Um, and so, uh, you know, now almost kind of more than, than ever or more than in the recent past, looking to other countries where they have a smoother um, process, which allows people to work um, would be very instructive. Um, so thank you for that question. Um, so here's another question. What will happen if the person got the benefits when the asylum is pending? So they cannot get those benefits. Um, when asylum is pending, you're not eligible to get the benefits. So when you try to apply, um, you get turned away. So they're only emergency like medical assistance, like in case of an emergency that they can apply for, but, uh, but regular food stamps and medical assistance, not available. Not eligible. Um, okay, so moving up, um, uh, I, I want to draw your attention to some information that was put in the chat about um, HB 769, which is the driver's license bill, which is pending in Pennsylvania. Um, so driver's licenses, as you heard from Sarah earlier, um, are really a critical piece of this puzzle about the staffing crisis and about having sufficient workers in Pennsylvania to attract businesses because a lot of businesses, either they require drivers um, or you need to be able to drive to get to them. Um, so either way, it's very important. Um, and relatedly, there's a question in the chat for Sarah. Um, so hopefully we can get her back on. Um, the question is, what is the process for the chamber to publicly support driver's licenses? I know you had said they hadn't made a decision. Is there a process? Is there um, some way that the chamber can be contacted about this? I think right now the process is that um, we have spoken to a number of our consultants who work with us um, in Harrisburg to ask them for uh, a few additional things. I know that there is a policy paper that accompany, accompanies this that we're evaluating. Um, so that is the next step for us really is to analyze that. And then as always with this sort of thing, we do get member feedback. Um, my perspective is specific to the talent concerns and I can certainly see the opportunities there, um, but we do put it out to our kind of electoral politics and advocacy committees and see what feedback we get from them. So it's a due diligence process right now. And we are, Catherine and the rest of the team and I spoke about how we can advance things um, post call today. So I think this is a good um, kind of, I wouldn't say first step, but maybe maybe second or third step. And for our audience, so they know, um, Highest Pennsylvania is a member of the chamber. So, um, so we are hopeful that we can continue working with Sarah and um, kind of move this along. Um, so that's great. Okay. I think I think I got all of the questions in the chat. Um, if I missed anything, please feel free to repeat it. Um, and so now I just want to kind of turn it back um, to you, Sarah, because I know that when we were initially talking about this issue in today's um, discussion, you had said that you had some questions. And so I just you know, want to give you an opportunity if, if there's anything uh, that we can help. Oh, sure. Thanks. I think one of the things that really struck me um, when we had our prep call, where Shalou was able to provide some background and we were getting to know one another, you know, I, I'd be curious, just from your perspective, Shalou, or even anybody else who has, you know, lived experience on the call, is when we're guiding employers through how they can support those that may be experiencing all the turbulence and uncertainty that exists in this system, how can we best guide them 
um, to to be sensitive, but also to kind of, um, I guess, just to to respect some of the trauma associated with having this much uncertainty is is my question, while not violating the privacy of the individual who's going through some of these changes. Yes. So, just Kathy, you want to go ahead? Okay. Yeah. So, from from my perspective, I think I was. I think a lot of support to your, you know, your employee who's in that position, not just saying that, oh, your work authorization is going to expire. Sorry, we cannot keep you anymore. You know, like, because um, there are ways you could expedite the process, right? And that can only happen if the employer kind of shows that we they need this person to be in this position. And some of the employers are not willing to take that step or go that extra step. I was fortunate I was at highest PA where people understood, you know, what I was going through. And Kathy picked up the call again and again and again, making those phone calls. And you know, she did. Um, so, you know, giving them that support because it is not easy because you you are working, you know, when you're working in a position, you, you know, you, you need once your empl you know you have your back you know backing from your employer you know that gives kind of just relieves a lot of tension from you know and and the output on the work right um as i'm waiting for my work authorization to come through you know if you know you know what my employer is there behind me walking with me making those phone calls to uscis not giving up and when they see a constant you know, pressure from them, you know, that this this employee is needed, then they might, you know, say, okay, you know what, well, let's just go ahead and approve it. Okay. But that that's not just one I would have would like everyone to be like that. And I hope like the it will be the best that USCIS doesn't have these kind of backlogs because then employers don't have to have to make those calls. But if there is a backlog, I would like that that's a support that they would definitely need that assurance that they are there for them. And I think if I could just add a little bit more, Sarah, from the employer's perspective, you know, um, the, obviously we're an immigration refugee resettlement agency. So of course our perspective is gonna be to support the immigrant worker. But I think even as just a business person, right? Who's worried about the bottom line, um, you know, your employees, I mean, as you as you've been saying, right, with the staffing crisis, like they are the biggest asset. Um, and, you know, whether the person who's facing work authorization problems is, you know, a truck driver, a receptionist, a doctor, a nurse, a tech person, regardless who they are, they're someone that's been getting the job done. And, it's really not so easy to just say like, oh, you know, too bad. I, I'm, I'm sorry, your work authorization is going to expire, you know, to think that you can just replace them and not have it have an impact on your bottom line, I think is false. And so I think it's well worth it. It's much more cost effective to say, look, we're going to do everything within our power to get this expedited, to get it moved along, which includes calling your congressional representative, filing for an expedited work authorization, um, you know, and, and that's in the individual case. I think in the, um, in the broader sense, you know, part of, as you well know, the purpose of this discussion is to get employers to connect those dots, right? Um, you know, they're having staffing crises, they're talking about it, they're upset about it, uh, as they should be. There are lots of businesses that are operating in, you know, fewer hours um, that are facing closure because they can't make it work. Um, but they don't seem to have realized that the part of a major part of the crisis is not advocating with Congress about fixing the work authorization process, you know? Um, and fixing that would do a huge amount for um, releasing a number of hardworking individuals who want nothing more than to work, <laughs> um, you know? So, um, so I think, 
I think that's another kind of broader aspect, right? Is getting the business industry to connect those dots and to say to Congress, look, you have to stop this. Like this is having an impact. We've we've tried, you know, all the normal routes to get staff and it hasn't worked. And so we need to now make sure that the immigrants who are here are able to work. So um, so two more questions came in the chat. Are people without work authorization permitted to work in a situation where they're provided with food and shelter, but not pay, such as live-in caregiving nannies restaurant work? So Shalu, you want to take that? Um, it kind of, it's, it's a pretty tricky question, right? Because <laughs> uh, it kind of just comes down to whether that position can be paid or not. Um, and if it's paid, it considers to be like, even though it's a voluntary work, you know, it's considered to be a paid position, things like that. So it's, it's a little complicated, right? Because, and um, so again, there, there are, um, I think regulations about even just volunteering, voluntary work um, in immigration law. Um, I'm not, I haven't gone in depth into it, but I, I, I know that, you know, we have to be very careful as to how, you know, clients take up on those uh, things. So. And I, I do know too, Shalu is very modest, but when, when all of this crisis happened for her in, as we've said, in addition to herself, she was worried about her clients. And so initially we talked about her doing some volunteer work for like her most urgent cases, but you're not really allowed to do that. Um, and you can't do anything that looks like work, mm -hmm. even if you're not getting paid. Yeah. So, um, so that was, you know, just amplified the crisis. Um, so then there's a comment in the chat, which is also, I think, Sarah, going back to your comment about what can employers do. So aside from the work authorization piece, uh, there's they should expand their approval of trainings and education obtained outside the U.S. Um, the audience member was tutoring an individual who had a high school diploma from Morocco and the employers in the U.S. would not validate it and said that he needed to get a GED. So that's an interesting point. Um, and I don't know, you know, uh, whether this is a conversation the chamber has had or, you know, so, yeah. I think it is to the extent that a lot of employers have qualifications requirements that they are currently increasingly reviewing and changing. So a large employer that works with a background check company for example, that has many of these systems in place that don't allow for any nuance is likely to not accept a credential of that kind because, you know, it, it's it's kind of farmed out to a third party who does that service on behalf of the employer. Um, so I do find increasingly large and small employers alike are taking a look at all of those processes associated with with background checks, which include the verification of education in addition to employment and other um, associated histories. So I, I, all that to say, I think that you are right. But again, almost like all of this that we're talking about today, there is a piece of the conversation that does seem to be missing around the availability of, of immigrants to work. And I don't often hear about the need to change qualifications from this perspective. It would be more about Philadelphians who have high school degrees or do not yet have it, but are pursuing it and whether or not they can get access to opportunity. So I think that, you know, what a lot of this conversation is bringing up for me is the need to, to talk more about, uh, to talk more inclusively about these things um, to raise it, the profile with employers. So I think, thank you for that point. I think it's an opportunity. Yeah. And I think one of the things that, I mean, I realize not to not to make things uh, crazy or unreasonable on the employer's perspective, but at least for much, for large corporations like Wawa or something like that, who have um, presumably staff that can investigate this, it certainly makes you think, you know, it would be worth investigating what curricula in various countries are you know, for, for a high school diploma. Um, because in this day and age, you know, 
business is international, whether you intended to be or not. Um, and, and, you know, because of the internet, you can easily obtain information about what people are teaching. So to the extent that you're concerned that a particular country doesn't teach, you know, something that you're concerned about, um, it's easily discovered. So, um, so I think that's another really interesting point. Um, okay, so um, I think at this point, we're ready to kind of wrap things up. Um, I don't know if Sarah or Shalu, you have any final comments um, or, no, nope. good, okay. Um, so thank you so much for the enlightening answers. Um, we are out of time. So if there's any further questions that you have, um, please feel free to email them to Becca Weber. She put her email information in the chat and stay tuned for our next Ask Me Anything. As always, you can learn more about how to support uh, asylum seekers, DACA recipients, other immigrants and refugees at our website at www.highspa.org. Um, thank you so much. We appreciate your time.